go ahead and get started this evening. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out to the house of the Lord this evening. Trust you've been much in prayer for the service, much in prayer one for another. And uh, we'll get started with the word of prayer. I'll ask Brother Johnny Pine if he will open us up in prayer. Lord Father, thank you for letting us be here tonight. Lord Father, thank you for every uh, prayer that you advance before us. Uh, we lift our, keep more our prayer list up to you each and every uh, night and, and, and during the day. Lord Father, thank you for all of our uh, blessings. Father, just getting up in the morning, like you let us wake up in the morning is a blessing. There's a lot of people that just overlook. Lord Father, thank you for uh, everything you do for our church and that you let our church have good sound financial uh, dependence, independence and we, uh, we're, we're growing and Lord we, uh, we just thank you for, for all that and Lord uh, be with our law enforcement, be with our uh, military and uh, thank you for giving your son to God on the cross for us so we can all have everlasting life and uh, have somebody to Let's all stand this evening and grab a hymn book, or let's all stand this evening and we will sing. I can't remember what we're singing tonight. <laughs> Since Jesus came into my heart. That's, so let's all stand this evening and sing. We'll sing the first and the last. Oh. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into. Anybody 
else. Obey it in the lust there 
Uh, notice this tonight. When sin is obeyed, sin will express itself through the organs of the body. And through this channel reigns in both the natural man and in the carnal man. Such a state of affairs, however, should not be characteristics of the believer. For his body is set free from the reign of sin. In order to enjoy this victory, the believer must cooperate with God and determine that by God's grace, sin will not reign. When you think about that tonight, I think about sin reigning tonight in like a in an alcoholic. Their body just craves more and more and more alcohol. And it takes more and more alcohol for them to be able to function and more and more alcohol for them to be able to get drunk. And what happens is, is the, uh, their alcohol is beginning to rule and reign in their body. Tonight, alcoholism isn't the only thing that's raining. But I think about religion tonight being a sin. People get so involved and so deep in the cords and the bonds of religion. They join the church. They sing the choir. They sing in the choir. They teach Sunday school. They do all of this, and they let religion reign in them. But they never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I think about Judas Iscariot, and we can argue about if he was a Christian or not. I do not believe that he was. Nowhere will you ever find Judas Iscariot ever repented for betraying Christ. But when you think about Judas Iscariot, Judas Iscariot did everything that the rest of the disciples did. And at the end of the day, Judas Iscariot betrayed Christ. That proves that you can be the most religious of people and still not have your heart in the right place. There are tons of people that I, there are people that I know tonight that is preached, that is sung, that has done all of these wonderful things in the church. And if you would have known them in the prime of their so-called Christian ministry, you would have said that they was a great Christian. But tonight, their life does not bear any fruit of Christianity. Why? Because they've let sin reign and rule their mortal body. The Bible says tonight that no man can serve two masters. Either you're serving God or you're serving sin. When I think about that tonight, Paul said not let it reign your mortal body. What does he mean there? Number one, when a person is in sin tonight, and this is totally off the notes, all right? When a person is in sin tonight, and they're letting sin reign the, in their life, number one, that's all that their mind is dwelling on is sin. Y'all with me this evening? When you think about the different sins, you can name one. Let's think about tonight a bank robber. I've been watching this TV show called I've Always Got Away With It, all right? I love it. It is, it is very addicting if you start watching it to watch the stupidity of people, all right? But a man, one recent one, he was a bank robber. And you know what he did all day? He sat and dwelled on different ways to rob a bank and get away with it. That sin ruled, ruled and reigned in his life. He would leave at 7 o'clock in the morning like he had a normal job. And he would sit and go in a bank parking lot. And he would sit there and draw out and watch how the bank operated. What times of the day were busy. What times of the day were slow. What times of the day the business people went in. And I had all of this time been involved in sin. Y'all with me this evening? Sin ruled him. When you think about that, you know he think about that. But the Bible says that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Why does sin rule in our lives? Why does sin reign in our lives? Because tonight sin paints a beautiful picture. Sin will tell a man that another woman is better than the wife that he's with now. Y'all with me? 
Sin will tell a woman that another man is better than the husband that she's with now. Sin tonight will tell you that the, sin tonight will tell you that drugs and different things will not ruin your life. Sin tonight will paint a picture. If you go rob this bank, you'll have this lump sum of cash. Sin will tell you that if you go out and kill all of these people, you'll become a famous person. And what happens is that sin paints that picture and you lust after it. And you become to dwelling on it. And pretty soon that sin is ruling in your body. And just tonight as we think about this, Paul is commanding us to put our body in check. And put our flesh in check and say, no, I'm not going to let sin rule and reign in my life. Just as tonight, an athlete must put himself in check. For example, how many of you watch the Antonio Brown walk off the field this week? Or seen it in years? If you did, raise your hand. How do you think he had that nice set of abs? And them muscles. And look like, like I probably need to go to the gym and work out. <laughs> you know how he did that? He put his body in subjection. And he said, in order for me to be the best athlete that I can be, I must not let certain foods, certain drinks, Certain things come into my body that it would hinder me from being the best athlete that I can be. And just as he's done that and has such a physical, a physical what's, appearance of being in a perfect health, you and I must do the same thing spiritually. And we must say to ourselves, in order for me to be the best Christian that I must be, I must put my physical body in subjection to Christ. And say, I refuse to let sin reign in my body. You with me this evening? Does that make sense? It does say amen. amen. All right, number two. Not only is it a physical principle, but second of all tonight, it is a moral principle. How do you get that? Go with me to verse number 13. When you find your place in verse 13, say amen. amen. Neither yield ye your members as what, church? Instruments. What is an instrument? Something that has to be used by another means. Am I right? A piano is, in, is counted as what? An instrument. Now, I can look at that piano and tell that piano to play. Is it going to play? I can tell that piano to power on. Is it just going to power on? No. How's that piano going to power on? Someone is going to have to go over there and press a button. How's that piano going to play? Someone has to go over there and take their fingers and attempt to make it sound good. Am I right? That instrument has made itself available for use. Y'all with me? Tonight, if we yield ourselves to sin, we are making ourselves instruments of unrighteousness. Tonight, you and I have the responsibility to say yes and no. Tonight, if I ask you to, if I ask you for a favor, and you said, yeah, I can do that, what have you done? You've made yourself an instrument so that that favor can be completed, right? 
So when the devil presents a temptation in front of you, you have the same responsibility to say yes or no. This right here is where I disagree with people say so-and-so fell into sin. Because so-and-so had the responsibility to step up and say, no, I don't want to be used as a member of unrighteousness. Y'all with me? I'll give you an example. Several years ago, I was in a revival meeting. There was a young preacher there who was probably in his early 30s, mid-30s. And all of these people worshipped the ground he walked on. He could quote multiple verses of scripture out of the Bible. He could take you and tell you all of the history about the Baptist faith. He could go off and tell you all of these things. He could get up and he could preach beautiful sermons. But if you ever come in contact with a person and you knew something just wasn't right and you couldn't put your finger on it. I was in that meeting and someone came up to me and said, and one of my friends came up to me and said, so and so's doing good. He's at the highlight of his ministry and just really talked him up. And I made this statement. I said, There's something that I just can't put my finger on. That night we was in that revival meeting. He got up and preached a powerful message on sin. I've never heard nothing like it in my life. And to this day, I've not heard many messages on the particular topic he preached on. He got done, and I, something just wasn't right. Something just wasn't right. I went on about my business. I said no more about it. I wasn't critical of him anything. I just moved on. <clears throat> about two and a half to three years ago, I was in a meeting, and he would usually be there. I said, where's so-and-so? Oh, ain't you heard? I said, heard what? He's pastoring his church part-time now. I said, what? He said, that's not a part-time job. You're either there full-time or you're not there at all. And he said, no, he's pastoring his church part-time now. He's become a police officer. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, you can't do that. I said, you, you can have a secular job and be a pastor, but... The hours a police officer works in church, it just don't mix. You can't, too, many, too much is involved. You know, yeah, you could be scheduled to get off at 7 o'clock on Sunday morning and be ready to go in the pulpit at 10 o'clock. But what happens if you get that call of a homicide or something like that and you ain't going to make it? You ain't going to be there. I said, it ain't going to work. A few months went by. I was out and about one day and somebody called me. Said, have you heard about so-and-so? It's the last I heard they was doing this and that. They said, so-and-so's lost their family. So-and-so's not pastoring a church. So-and-so's not darkened the doors of the church now in almost two and a half years. And I'll never forget the person looked at me that was telling me all this and said, what do you think caused that? And I said, they let sin run their life. They let, is it a sin to be a police officer? No. Is it a sin to be a firefighter? No. But if you're a pastor, it's hard to serve in one of those roles full because it takes so much time and involvement of your life that your focus will be taken away from the Word of God and from the things of God. All right? I've served in the fire department. I know how much time and effort it takes to do that. And when you think about that, I said, this man had such a mind for the Bible and mind for all of this stuff. But he made himself an instrument. And today, all of that stuff that he used to do is just a memory. And when you think about all of that tonight, you think about how many other 
people tonight is on the right track as a Christian. But all it takes is for them to make themselves one time an instrument for unrighteousness. And they ruin their testimony. So tonight Paul gave us a stern warning in verse number 12. Let us not therefore, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. And then he said, neither yield ye your members as interest instruments as unrighteousness unto sin. When we think about this tonight, three great words are mentioned in this chapter. And they give you the ability to live a victorious Christian life. The word know, reckon, and yield. We dealt last week with the word reckon in chapter number six. That means to pay attention to. That means to that means that's the word we get recognized from. That means to give an account to. The word know, knowledge is everything. Ignorance is not bliss. Okay? I don't care what anybody else says. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance does not advance anyone. In the Christian walk with God. In order to be successful as a Christian. You're going to have to have a knowledge. Of the word of God. A knowledge of the things of God. A knowledge of what a prayer life is. Am I right this evening church? <coughs> you're in that word knowledge there. We get the word know. That word know right there. Means to recognize. And then. Paul tonight gets us in verse number 13 the word yield. The word yield means to give yourself to. Tonight if you're driving and get off right there at, uh, is that 21 right there off of uh, 150 and you come up to that sign and it's a yield sign. What do you do? You do not have to stop there unless traffic is coming. You look and if there's no traffic you keep rolling. What are you doing? You're yielding to the things that are around you. Tonight, Paul said, do not yield ye members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So not only tonight is there a physical principle involved, not only is there a moral principle involved. Are we good on moral tonight? We good? Say amen. amen. All right, stay here in verse number 13 with me. Then there's a spiritual principle involved. When you think tonight... It is not enough to make a resolution that the members will not be yielded to sin. Many people have tried this method of living with little to no success. Victory does not rest ultimately upon our moral resolve, but upon a spiritual principle. When we think about that, how do you get that? The Bible says in verse number 13, the last part, but yield yourselves unto who, church? God. As those that are, what? Alive from the what? Dead. And your members, as what, church? Instruments of righteousness unto God. So you want to be used by God, you're going to have to make yourself available. To God. If you want to be successful as your Christian walk tonight, you're going to have to make your, you're going to have to come before God and say, God, I want to be an instrument used by you. Y'all with me this evening? When we think about that instrument, I think about James chapter number four and verse number seven. Anybody know what James four seven says tonight? I'll tell you what most people think it says tonight. You ready to hear what most people think it says tonight? It, most people think it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Is that what James 4, 7 says tonight? That's what the last part of James 4, 7 says. Do you know what the first part of James 4, 7 says? Submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, 
and you came up to me and you was going to rob me. All right? And you had a knife in your hand and you was going to rob me at knife point. And I turned around to you and I said, just go away from me. I ain't going to give you any money. Do you think you would run from me at that point? Why? Because there's nothing at that moment that I'm showing that has any power to overcome you as a thief. Am I right? All right. Now, let's, let's take this as a Christian. Tonight, if you as a Christian who is not submitted to God, and the devil comes by with temptation... And you look at the devil and say, Hey, devil, I'm resisting you. Go away. But you're not submitted to God. Are you showing him that you have any power to overcome him? Y'all following this illustration? But now let's go back to you as a robber. If you are a robber and you come up to rob me and you have a knife. All right. And I turn around. And you walk up behind me and said, hey, I'm going to rob you. I want your wallet. I want your keys. I want everything that you have. And I reach in my pocket and I pull out a gun. And I turn around and I tell you straight up, I'm not giving you anything. Move away from me. What do you think you're going to do? You better run. Am I right? Why? Because at that point, I have proven to you that I have the power to overcome you, right? Whether if I shoot you in the arm or I shoot you in the chest, I have the power to overcome your little knife, right? At that point, you're going to run. Tonight, as a Christian, in order for you to be able to resist the devil, you're going to submit yourself to God. And you're going to make yourself available to God. And then when the devil comes to you and says to you, here's this temptation, here's this sin that I want you to overcome, that I want you to participate in, and you tell the devil, resist, I'm resisting you, get away from me. And the devil sees the power and the presence of God in your life. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to run. Why? Because he sees the person that can overcome him. The reason tonight so many Christians are willingly walking in sin tonight and giving themselves over to sin is because they've not submitted themselves to God. Think about that. When you think about this part, the spiritual principle tonight is yielding yourself to God. When we yield ourselves, we're yielding to His power, we're yielding to His Spirit. And thirdly, tonight, in verse number 14, we see the victory that Christ gives. For sin shall not have what, church? Dominion over you. Why? For ye are not under the what? Law. But what? Under grace. Paul tonight says, number one, that the, that the spiritual man that yields himself to Christ will have the victory that sin does not reign. When you have the power of God in your life tonight, Paul, uh, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, verse number 65, For thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Is that what it said? What the psalmist is saying here is I've yielded myself to God. And because of that, the Holy Spirit is inside of me telling me not to yield to sin. And when I don't yield to sin, I'm that much closer to God 
and sin will have no chance of having dominion over me as a Christian. Tonight, a person that's yielded themselves to sin, will, you'll never have found that they've not been fully yielded to God. You'll find out that they've not been fully yielded to a prayer life. And you'll find out they've not been fully yielded to the Word of God. For those three things were in him. It was God's original plan for man to have dominion in this world. If you go read Genesis chapter number 1, I think it's verse number 26 or 27. We think about in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve surrendered that to Satan. And they doom themselves and become slaves to sin. Why? Because they made themselves instruments of unrighteousness. Lot could have had a powerful testimony as a Christian, but Lot yielded himself to unrighteousness. And because of that, Lot lost everything that he had. If Lot would have yielded himself to God, Lot would have never went down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot would have said, Abraham, I'm getting rid of my servants that's causing strife between us. And Abraham, I'm going with you and we're going with God. Now if Abraham would have done exactly what God told him to, he would have never brought Lot with him. Go back and study it. Bible didn't tell, God didn't tell Abraham, Abraham, I want you and Lot to go out. He said, Abraham, I want you to go. Tonight, be careful when God tells you something, dragging, some, dragging someone else to go with you because you may be taking a lot with you. Y'all with me? All right, moving on. When we think about this tonight, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Preacher, what do you mean by that? I want to say tonight, not only will not sin not have dominion over us because we're in God's word, but tonight, last part of this first point that we've dealt with, we must go on in God's way. The law makes all of these things. If you sin, if you do this, if you do that, if you do this, you do that. But grace says you're forgiven. Grace says you are loved. Grace says I can restore unto you what sin had taken away. For where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. When the law says that you should have died because of your sin, grace says, I spared your life so that you could be forgiven of your sin. When the law says condemn, you must pay the payment of sin. Grace said, pardon, you're free from the debt of sin. When the law says you are a slave to sin, grace spoke up and said, I bought you and I paid for you that you are no longer a slave to sin, but now you are a servant of God. In order to go in God's way, you have to realize that the grace of of God is in abundant supply and is sufficient for every need. Are we good tonight? We good? Say amen. amen. All right. Moving on. Verse number 15. We're going to deal with sin. The old master is now <coughs> defeated or disposed of. Preacher, how do you get that? When we get here tonight, Paul's next illustration is that of a master and a slave. There's a word that was used here in my in this book that I've been using to teach on Wednesday nights. And the word was emancipated. Now there's only one other time that I remember that word being used. Would somebody like to tell me where that word was or the 
concept of that word was used? Of a proclamation. What would what did that do? That freed the slaves from their slave owners, right? It said that no one else could be a slave. All right. Am I right about that? My history serves me correctly. Abraham Lincoln was the one that signed that, if I remember correctly. Now, if you want to make some of our uh, snowflakes mad, just remind them that Abraham Lincoln would have fell into the conservative party and not the liberal party. And that will blow their mind every time. So we ain't going into that tonight, all right? But, but the writer here used the word emancipation from the old master. When you think about that tonight, that means freedom from the old master. Right? you no longer a slave. Preacher, what does it mean that I'm no longer a slave? Number one tonight. It means that you have a new liberty. Preacher, where do you get that? Go with me to verse number 15. Now we know verse number 14 says, but we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Okay? So the crowd here asked Paul a question. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Now, when God gives you the liberty as a Christian, that does not give you the freedom to go out and act like a pure out heathen. All right? This liberty is not a license to sin. It's the opposite. One writer put, no person can accept victory who doesn't really want victory. No person can accept victory who has a soft attitude toward sin. When you think about that tonight, this victory that God has given us, this emancipation from being, a, from being a master, from our master as a slave, does not give us the license to continue in sin. The liberty that this has given us is the liberty to live a full life in Christ, with Christ, for the glory of Christ. Does that make sense? This liberty tonight allows you to be forgiven of your past sin, your present sin, your future sin. This liberty tonight has given you an eternal home in heaven. This liberty tonight allows you to be on the receiving end of all of the blessings from God. This liberty tonight allows the Holy Spirit to be inside of you, to lead you and to guide you in all truth. Go with me. So when we think about the liberty tonight, Paul answered and said, God forbid, go with me to verse number 16. Know ye not that to whom ye, what's that next little word, church? Yield yourselves Servants to obey. His servants ye are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So tonight, if I stop the church service, if we stop right here, and don't want you to raise your hand, don't want you to say nothing, I want you to answer this question in your heart. Who are you a servant to? Paul said tonight, you are a servant to whom ye, what? Obey. So either tonight you're a servant to sin, right? Or you're a servant of righteousness. Where is your life tonight? You call yourself a Christian? You call yourself called of God? You call yourself Christ-like? But who and what are you serving tonight? Moving on. When we think about this, 
taught God, let me, let me back it up. God, when Israel was rebellious, God didn't look lightly upon their sin. When you went over to Jeremiah chapter number 22, I mean 29, and I remember, it may be not Jeremiah 29, but the Bible talks about, and ye shall seek me, but you won't find me. Am I right? Is that Jeremiah that he talks about that in? Somebody can yeah. tell me if I'm right or wrong on that. But why was that? Because the people of God, the chosen people of God, had decided that they wanted to be rebellious and be servants of sin. Moving on. Now let's get down to verse number 17 and 18. Are we good on 15 and 16? Am I clear? All right, verse number 17. What else do you see here? Not only do I see a new liberty, but this liberty tonight becomes an attitude and it consummates in an attainment. Preacher, how do you get that? But God be thanked that ye, notice this word, were the servants of sin. That word were. He didn't say ye are the servants of sin, but he used that word were. And if I remember that word, the word, it is a past tense word. Is that a verb? Am I right about that? Past tense verb, right? Is it, it's a verb, right? Somebody right about that. Right. See, I did learn something in English, didn't I? It's a past tense verb. Ye were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Verse number 18. Being then made free. Notice that. That word free right there is not a past tense. If it was a past tense word, it would be freed. Right? Free. That word free right there is a present tense. From sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. When I see that tonight, I think about how God came to the slave market of sin. The world and purchased us with his own blood so that you and I could be free from the bondage of sin. Could you imagine going to a slave country that still operates past slaves? Could you imagine going tonight into one of those places and asking the slave owner Hey, what would it take for me to purchase your slave? And that slave owner tells you a price. And you reach in your wallet. Say that price was $100. You could go back there and get John's wallet and reach in deep and pull out several of those. So you could buy several. Purchase several slaves. All right? Every time we've had an event at the church and it's involved me, I've seen $100 bills come out of his wallet. All right? So I know he's got some. Phyllis, you need to go shopping and get his wallet, okay? <laughs> but when you think about that tonight, and the, and the person who owns the slave says, you can purchase my slave for me for X amount of dollars, and you pay. And that slave owner gives you that slave. And you look at that slave and you say, ma'am, sir, you're no longer a slave, but you are free. Could you imagine the joy that would come across that slave's face? He, be, he or she may be like, what am I supposed to do? What do you mean I'm free? In other words, you do not have to serve this person or myself any other day. You be you. And you do what is best for you. Can you imagine the joy that would bring? But think about that. God did that for us. 
He came into the slave market of this world. He purchased us. He made us free. He's given us the liberty to serve with a whole heart. Him. And the joy that that brings. And when we think about it, we're just like, well, that's what God did for us on the cross. No, I guarantee you, if you went into the slave market and bought a purchase a slave and set them free, they would shout with joy that they was free. And tonight, you and I should count it a joy and a privilege to be free from this world of sin. Moving on. Not only does this emancipation bring a new liberty, second of all tonight, this emancipation brings a new loyalty. Preacher, how do you get that? Go with me to verse number 19 and 20. I gotta hurry up. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants, notice that word words back again, the servants of sin. Now this is a scary thought. Ye were free from righteousness. Read that verse again. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What does he mean there? He makes the comparison that when you was a servant of sin, you was not a servant of God. When you was a servant of sin as a lost person, you was not operating under the power and the grace of God. That's a scary thought, isn't it? At this point, he's put you back into, because he's dealing with servants of sin, at this point, he's put you back into your old state as a lost person. Preacher, what was I? A wretched sinner that deserved to go to hell. I wasn't under grace, but I was condemned by my sin. I wasn't a righteous person. And in order tonight, now that ye have yielded yourselves to righteousness, and yielded yourself to Christ, you become an instrument to God. And Christ with his own blood has made you righteous. Isaiah 64, 6 talks about our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's talking about our self-righteousness. When God comes to you and shows you that you're lost, you say, but God, I'm a church member. But God, I'm a choir member. But God, I'm a Sunday school teacher. But God, I do this. But God, I do that. God says... That is filthy before me. Why? Because you are a servant of sin. The only righteousness tonight that you can receive must come from God. Lastly tonight, preacher, what do you see? Not only do I see a loyalty, not only do I see tonight a liberty, but lastly, tonight I see a longevity. Preacher, how do you get that? Go with me to verse number 21. <clears throat> verse 21. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now, what church, ashamed? Can I say this tonight? The things that we did when we were lost, we should not be proud of. You know, I've heard people tonight brag when they was lost 
that they could do so many drugs and it wouldn't affect them. They could drink so much alcohol and it wouldn't affect them. And they would brag that they could do this and that they could do that. And they boast about their sin. But tonight, friend, when we think about how unclean we was before God as a lost person, we shouldn't brag about what we did as lost when we were lost, but we should be ashamed of what we did when we were lost. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with telling your testimony about where God brought you from, but the minute you start bragging about how much sin you was in to make yourself look so bad, and it doesn't become about glorying God, bringing glory to God where God brought you from. You must be ashamed. For the end of those things is what church? Death. There was nothing lasting about the old life of sin. But instead it hurried us and it sped up our life that much closer to eternity. But preacher, how is how tonight and how does that give us a new longevity? Longevity. Go to verse number 22. But now being made free from what? Sin. That word free again is a present tense, right? But now, that word now means present, being made free from sin, and become servants to God. Ye have fruit unto holiness, and the end is what, church? Everlasting life. So either tonight you can have the sinful life, which is death, or tonight you can accept God's life, which is everlasting. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Our emancipation from sin guarantees unqualified success in this life. And, but our fruit unto holiness and unqualified security for the next life. Eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The old master shamed us and paid us the wages of death. The new master, being Christ, makes us holy and gives us life forevermore. And that's the victory that we have in Christ tonight. Any questions, any comments, any concerns? I spent out a lot on this tonight, didn't I? All right, everybody understand it though. Are we good? Any questions? John, how many hundred dollar bills you got tonight? That's the only question I have. I'm sure others have got that question too. Ma'am? Zima, did you get them all? Yeah, you did when you got that new van, didn't you? <laughs> all right, anything on anybody's heart tonight before we dismiss? All good? We're good. Say amen. Alright, we'll dismiss with a word of prayer. Ain't you good to have Miss Joyce here tonight? Mm -hmm. That's a blessing. That's another